actually relevant or not. To Amendment 54 in the names of the Labour Lord, Lord Vaux and Baroness Bowles, um, I'm going to rise fairly briefly in an extremely unusual situation. I'm going to agree with everything that's been said from all sides of your Lordship's house. Um, and what I'm going to aim to do is simply um, set out a couple of extra points to that. Picking up particularly on the points of the mm. Noble Lord, Lord Vox, um, in terms of its journalists and campaigners, groups like Transparency International, who have frequently very bravely and at considerable certainly financial risk themselves and perhaps even, even more than that risk themselves, help to uncover the situation that we have, whether you call it the London Laundry Map, whether you call it um, the centre of global corruption, the many labels that have been applied. And what these amendments do, but particularly Amendment 54 does, is opens up so that people like that can see what is happening, can examine what's happening. We have seen that the regulators have utterly failed to provide the sort of check that they should provide, and transparency at least enables NGOs, campaigners, other people to do what really should be the regulators' work for them. Now, I think um, what we have, what I would like to see is Companies House not relying on any independent certification practice, doing its own checks itself. However, I will acknowledge the practical reality that you, of that would require an enormous institutional setup. Um, you might say who might pay for it, and I would say that if you are going to benefit from the uh, situation of being a limited liability company, then the cost should fully cover that. But I can see that's not going to happen. And if that isn't going to happen, then the best thing we can possibly have is at least make sure that these authorised corporate service providers are actually open to scrutiny of others. We really must not forget that what we are doing is asking what have been the enablers of corruption, the enablers of fraud, the enablers of sheer um, robbery to become the enforcers. That's actually what we're doing now. In more traditional term, we're asking the poachers to become gamekeepers. And that is something that carries a high level risk. And we have to, I think as your Lordship's house, as this committee, have a huge responsibility to do everything we possibly can to make sure that we have full oversight of that. And I think I would also just briefly like to comment, particularly on Amendment 51A in the name of the Noble Lord, Lord Coker and others. Um, and I think this uh, taking a risk-based approach and looking at the situation of where we have lots of industries with really huge problems. Some of them are identified here, and I think the car wash situation is one of the clear ones. Uh, there was a recent study from Nottingham Trent University that showed that only 11% um, of workers in hand car washes were getting pay slips. The most basic kind of arrangement that enables you to see what's going on, what's happening, there's not even the most basic things are happening there. We have a huge problem in so many sectors of our society. <coughs> Farmers Weekly, just a couple of weeks ago, exposed huge levels of fraud and significant public health risks as a result in our food sector. We know what's happened in our building sector, where we've left um, local councils not having the resources have been stepped away and we've gone to self-certification and we have huge problems with the standards in our building sector. These problems are there and a lot of them go back to the financial sector. So these amendments I think are absolutely crucial to dealing with um, problems that are right across our economy. And I think the final point I'd like to make is sometimes it seems like, oh, this is all financial stuff and it's not really related to people's lives and it's sort of somehow a victimless crime. <coughs> but the reality is we are robbing people around the world, poor people around the world, through enabling London to be a centre where corrupt money is placed. We are enabling in our own society whole sectors of our economy to be consumed by businesses built on fraud, corruption and exploitation of workers. And as I've forgotten one of the noble lords opposite said, that of course makes it astonishingly difficult or impossible for honest business people to set up, run and thrive. Uh, I rise principally, um, I won't enjoy, uh, adjoin the complete love in, but uh, focus on uh, Lord uh, Cromwell's uh, amendment uh, and particularly his um, 52 to 
uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, his, his amendment that, 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 that covers the point about SE, SIC codes and the, the requirement that the SIC codes are accurate. Uh, and to echo and perhaps take further his remarks about the problems that uh, exist with SIC codes. I appreciate this would not be in the Minister's remit to answer this uh, 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 during this debate, but perhaps he might take time to write to us afterwards to comment on SIC codes. As he knows, they, they, they came into operation in 1948 when there was a very different business environment. They have been refreshed since then, but the last refresh was in 2007, and a huge amount has happened since 2007. Uh, the Khalifa, the Ron Khalifa report commented that about 50% of fintech companies don't have a, uh, a, an appropriate SIC code. And there are many companies that fall into a number of SIC codes, but uh, a company can only choose four. And in fact, out of the 5.3 million companies uh, on Companies House, uh, 3.9 million have chosen only one code, which says to me that they're just not taking it seriously. Uh, and they're not taking it seriously because they don't see the SIC codes as particularly relevant or helpful to them. They're often just repeating the previous year's one or indeed the one of incorporation, which an accountant may have chosen almost by random. And as a result, many companies are choosing the SIC codes starting with other, such as uh, 82990, other business services. And in some areas, a third of companies are going just for other. Now, it, the reason it's important is a whole lot of government decisions are made on understanding what businesses actually do and how many businesses are in a particular sector. During COVID, it was apparent from the event industry that large numbers of event, of event companies hadn't proper, properly registered their business within the SIC codes. So government wasn't able to assess the needs of those companies. Uh, and likewise, for business searches, for helping businesses market to other businesses, unless they know what the, those businesses, particularly conglomerates, uh, uh, undertake, it's very difficult uh, to, to make progress uh, for such businesses. Private enterprise has come up with its own version of SIC code, so rating agencies and others, people like Data City, have created their own SIC codes that, that they apply to businesses. Uh, so I very much hope that, that this might be an area of focus in the, in the very near future so that we can, we can enhance the existing SIC codes, give effect to Lord Cromwell's amendment, and then we can see what businesses actually do here in the UK. Uh, my, my order, I think speaking to the Minister before, before the committee commenced, I, I predicted that this is a group, this is the group which is crucial to what we'll be discussing, certainly in today's set of amendments. And I think your Lordships have demonstrated that through the, the detail and the concern that has been expressed around the issue of identity verification in general and, and more general issues. And I'm sure the Minister will have picked up that right across the floor, this isn't a political issue, this is a practical issue as to how this, how this Act or this bill, when it becomes an act, will work, or indeed if it will work. Um, and, and I th think it is worth emphasising that authorised corporate service providers can and do provide legitimate services for businesses, and we know that, and they're important. However, research by very many civil society organisations, not least Transparency International, has shown that in many cases they are at the, the spearhead of the abuse that is happening in our, in, in, in our society. They have been the enabler, the key enabler, to the money laundering that we have seen across this uh, country. And they've built shell organisations of thousands of companies in order to be able to do this process, which is why I think taken separately and together, these amendments all have something that I hope that the Minister will be able to take away and discuss both, both with your Lordships uh, with his colleagues and also with, with, with the team. And we've had some excellent speeches here. And I remind the Noble Minister that Amendment 48 requires that there be the publication of the identity of the a ACSP. And, and I think the question that many have been asked in different ways is, is why not? And I'd like to think that the Minister is actually broadly sympathetic to that note. And perhaps what your Lordships have done is given 
the minister some ammunition to go back to colleagues and to go back to departments and come back to us saying that indeed uh, the minister uh, agrees with us and will be able to publish those because I think it, it, it will be interesting to hear if, 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 the, if the opposite is true and I would like to hear what the minister believes would be the barrier to, to publishing the identity of the ACSP. Uh, Amendment 49 and 51 as we've heard from the local Lord Agnew and I, I regret not signing those amendments because I think they're absolutely central to the functioning uh, going forward. Uh, I think we heard that we need an, a, a, to establish a credible supervisory framework for ACSPs before we allow such services to be employed. And, and I think it's absolutely clear that we can't let these, or continue to let these services run loose without a credible structure and, uh, uh, for their supervision. And, and I think the, uh, the, the noble Lord, Lord Agnew, is completely correct there. Amendment 50A, um, proposed by the noble Lord uh, Cromwell and carrying my name, is absolutely clear, and, and I'm pleased to hear others, not least the noble Lord Lee, support the notion that, that further work is needed around SIC codes. Uh, I think uh, Amendment 51A, which the noble Lord Pontenby and colleagues proposed, is, is interesting, because I think the, the question he asks the government is how is it focusing on high-risk <coughs> strategy, high-risk sectors? Uh, it, it may be appropriate or otherwise to, to put something like this in um, primary legislation, <coughs> but the real question here is, is we know there are high-risk sectors. How is the government embracing that issue? Those sectors change from time to time. There are different trends. I hadn't even heard of candy shops five years and go and now walk down Oxford Street and you can see them there. There's a reason for that. Um, how does the government pick up on this? How does the regulation, regulators or companies' house pick up on this and what do they do? So I think that's the question that's buried in, 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 in that amendment and we'd like, um, and we'd like to hear. Uh, so, so I think, my lords, there's been some great debate around here and I think an awful lot I think for the Minister to chew on and whether uh, the Minister is able to come back in detail today or come back in writing, but I think there is a tremendous amount that we need to know before we get to report stage around this issue. So I would like to thank uh, the noble Lord, Lord Vaux of Harridan, for his amendments 48 and 54. Uh, my noble friend Lord Agnew of Alton for his amendments 49 and 51, the noble lords Lord Cromwell, Lord Fox and Baroness Bowles for their amendment 50A, Lord Coker, Lord Ponsonby and Baroness Blake for their amendments 50B and 51A, and Lord Coker for his amendment 52. Um, I hope I've got that right. I'm going to try and cover everything in order this time. Um, these all relate to authorised corporate service providers known as ACSPs, and I'm grateful for everyone's contribution in this debate. Just to uh, finish uh, just to cover one particular point made by the noble Lord Lord Naseby, the difference between foreign and worldwide. Um, foreign is if you have a, 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 a head, if you're headquartered abroad, worldwide is if you operate in a large number of jurisdictions, which I hope that clarifies that point that was asked. Um, Amendment 48. So this, uh, the, the question asked, <coughs> why not? Why not publish the uh, name of the authorised corporate service provider against their verification. Uh, someone, I think, the noble lord suggested that we're good advertising uh, for the uh, um, authorised corporate service provider to, to attach themselves. I'm sure uh, many of them would be delighted to attach themselves to noble lords' names when they are, are receiving their unique identification number. We have to hope that is the case. Uh, and I ask uh, that question myself: Why not? Uh, why, why wouldn't it be sensible to have the name of the um, verifier uh, next door to, to the entry? And I would like to have further discussions with um, noble lords as to how this can be achieved. Uh, I do not believe, the government does not believe that putting this into primary <coughs> legislation will be helpful um, given the complexities uh, around administering um, this process. There are also some specific areas where verification where identities need to be kept discreet, and so there may be complexities around the uh, process around identifying the ACSP in the sense of 
um, there wouldn't be a, uh, a, a verified identity to... to <laughs> I, I'm just... If, if, uh, if, if I may, if, if no one will allow me to continue along my train of thoughts just before uh, intervening, the difficulty I have is in finding too many justifications as to why it wouldn't be sensible for us to have a full consultation and a review as to why we wouldn't want to put the name of the um, ACSP next door to the identity that they've verified. And I welcome the input from this House and the discussion that we've had around this. Uh, but it isn't necessarily as simple as uh, accepting this clear amendment. Uh, I'm, what, uh, it will be important, I think, for the government to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Uh, but in principle, having a further discussion around this and seeing if there is a way to ensure that uh, the corporate providers can be clearly identified with the verification of the individuals um, in the company's house would seem to be something that we should look very closely at. And I know that I've had private conversations with a number of um, speakers in today's uh, committee proceedings where I've uh, been very clear in, uh, in, in what I'm trying to achieve, which is uh, exactly this, to increase transparency uh, and to make sure that um, the bad actors are clearly identified and the patterns of poor behaviour can be uh, measured and assessed effectively. However, I hope that uh, Noble Laws will respect my position in terms of the bill and the legislation, the amendments that we're discussing today, and my reluctance to support uh, that specific amendment and other associated amendments in a specific sense, uh, because I would want to make sure that we do this right, um, but you have my commitment to uh, look deeply into the possibility of ensuring um, that the proposals in essence that have been discussed today uh, are brought to bear um, in how we manage verification um, and listing of uh, ACSPs. And for his um, qualified support, I would say. I would be very interested to understand, though, why it is the government decided to go along with this recommendation for the overseas entity register and is resisting it, at least to some extent, for the domestic company's house. I'm not sure I really understand why the two things should be different at all. Well, I'm, I'm grateful, as always, for Noble Lord Lord Vaux, for, uh, for his interventions. And, as I say, we're looking forward to having a full discussion about this uh, over the proceedings um, of the next few weeks. So, from, from my personal point of view, it is right that there is a high degree of transparency, and I think it is absolutely right that we should look closely into trying to ensure that the identity of the verifier is also linked to the verification of the identity. And... Uh, <laughs> I was interested in the intervention of, my, of the noble Lord, Lord Vox, and I've been listening very carefully to what my noble friend, the Minister, has been saying. When we have these further discussions, either within a committee uh, session or elsewhere, could the Minister very kindly come with a few reasons uh, to support the arguments that he is putting forward at the moment? Because I just don't get the impression that we're, you know, the cogs are quite meeting here at the moment. Uh, I, I know that the Minister is under some constraint because this is a bill which has been pushed from the other place by the Secretary of State, uh, but I'd be quite interested to be able to get to grips with the underlying rationality which support the words that he is uttering at the moment. I don't, I don't, I'm not intending to be um, rude, and I hope I'm not coming across as rude, but I, I'm just and it's probably my fault for being obtuse. I'm just missing bits which might encourage me to think that we're moving forwards. Well, I thank the noble, my noble friend for, for his intervention, as always. Um, and I'm sorry if my, uh, if, if my words are, are not clear enough. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we will have conversations over the next uh, few weeks as this um, bill proceeds through this House that will allow us to come to a sensible conclusion around this. And in terms of trying to justify why we shouldn't um, publish the name of the ACSP uh, against the verified identity, um, of course we'll provide reasons. I think the point is, is to have a sensible and legitimate discussion about it. And it's not for me at this dispatch box to come up with um, a variety of different uh, reasons or excuses, because I think this is a very important point that we want to look into uh, with, with, with great seriousness. Partially to the aid of the noble the minister here, by pointing out, and I don't want to be partisan, but that 50A 
does not, uh, if, if for some reason, which we're all looking forward to hearing about, uh, it is felt that the companies who are registering these, these ACSPs are right to be shy about having their name attached. If for some reason we can be convinced of that, I would point out that 50A requires those companies simply to notify the registrar how many companies they have registered and the codes that they have used. And that will throw up the sort of patterns that the crime agencies are very interested in. For example, if registering company, uh, registering body X has registered 3,000 companies in a year or 300 companies under a particular code which is of interest, that will emerge very quickly from the data, even if it isn't necessary for some reason to attach the name of the company to the company it has registered. Uh, which I think, uh, in line with Lord Vaux's amendment, it should be, but I, I appreciate we're going to discuss that later. But I would just want to draw to the Minister's attention that the data, the statistics, which will enable those of interest, those who are interested, rather, to focus down on what companies are being registered by whom, in what sectors, would still emerge without having to attach the name of the registration body to the company. I thank the Noble Lord for uh, his interjection, and uh, I, I, I would like to clarify my point, which is that this is uh, a very relevant point raised by a number of uh, Noble Lords in, in this House, and I've been doing a great deal of investigation into this point over the last few weeks, and have great sympathy with the uh, sentiments expressed around making sure that these bodies that verify identity can be tracked in some way, in, in public, as much as in private, because I personally feel that to be very important. That, that there may be technical points that I have overlooked, and so I'm reluctant to commit today to accepting an amendment, as you can imagine. I think uh, it would be inappropriate to, um, for me to do that. But I hope you can hear from my clear words the commitment that we make to see whether or not uh, pr the principle around this amendment could be made possible um, as we look into how the bill will develop over the forthcoming uh, period. So I, I greatly thank Lord Hawks for um, his, uh, his amendment, and uh, I look forward to having discussions uh, over the next few weeks to see how we could find a way to try to implement the philosophy of the principles. I rise to best the Noble Lord and Minister to answer my specific question about consultation and what ACSPs asked for if they did in relation to this. Uh, but and, and I, I'm confident that the Noble Lord and Minister will have that discussion and include everyone. And, it, and, and it's very clear, you know, what his inclination is, if nothing else. But I, 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 I want to add just one testing question. I think this question is quite important. If, if an ACSP wished to have their identity associated with their professional, accurate and helpful work, and to have that association with the business which is being registered, known publicly, would this bill as amend, would, would the Companies Act as amended facilitate that? Would they be allowed to do that? Would they be allowed to, to publicise who they are? Or are we forcing anonymity on everyone who does this work and not to have their name associated with sterling work, world-class work? I'm just handing. I'm just handing you the his iPad. <laughs> I was grateful for the short respite uh, given to me, uh, by the changeover of the uh, Deputy Lord Speaker. I, I'm. I'm. Um, I'm. I'm. Thank the Noble Lord for that point, and I, I'm intrigued as to whether or not that is true. Um, and again, that is why I think it's important that we look into this in detail to ensure that it can be done properly, that we're making sure that we're making legislation that improves uh, accountability and transparency. But uh, without having to repeat myself for, for, for an additional time, I hope you feel comfortable, this, I hope this House feels comfortable, that uh, we've made a significant and serious commitment to see what we can do about this point. And uh, I will take a personal um, uh, interest in this uh, myself. Um, so if I, if I could move on to uh, which has just been, been raised, the standard industrial classification point, amend, Amendment 50A, um, so well put forward by 
Lord Cromwell. Um, I, I greatly thank the noble Lord for his proposed amendment and agree again with the intention to increase transparency. So if, if I may just go back one step, I, I think it's important that uh, th this House and the government um, are clear that, that ACSPs are, are not a criminal fraternity, um, that somehow every single ACSP is, is, is uh, designed to try to circumvent transparency and the law and is creating a, a wealth of uh, poorly structured and illegal corporate entities in order to run rings around our legal system. Um, the vast majority, the vast majority of ACSPs are well-run, legitimate organisations who we as individuals depend upon. If I can declare a conflict, I'm, I'm grateful for my accountant who performs an incredibly important function of trust and mutual benefit uh, and who I will rely upon. And I'm sure noble lords in this house would agree with me, rely upon their professional services provider to enable them to navigate what will become a slightly more complex uh, process in terms of ensuring that we do have transparency at companies' house. So it's very important we don't get the tone wrong. I would like to make sure that this, this government's views of this important sector is clearly projected. This is a very important economic sector, employing many thousands of people, doing a very important job, and we rely upon them to, uh, to do their function, and we support them. And to Lord Brown's question as to the uh, consultation, um, we, we consulted widely um, on, uh, with ACSPs and, in fact, numerous stakeholders. I think we had, many th we had over 1,000 uh, consultation pieces um, to consider for, the, for this bill. So we have been closely engaged uh, with them, and I'm very contented to go back and continue engaging with them over this single point. And I'll be absolutely delighted to return to this House with any specific reasons that are raised so that then we can debate them and decide whether or not they are legitimate or not. But I hope you hear the, the principle uh, around which I um, am committed. On that same point, because um, maybe uh, following on from, from what the Minister has, has actually said about the vast majority of these organisations being, being good and uh, trustworthy and so on, um, is it that the risk of one mistake being associated with them because their name is available um, means that people would not want to do it. And I mean, my associated other question that I asked is what, what, what was the consequence or penalty for, for getting an identification verification wrong? And I, I made the parallel with, with re the rental side of things where, you know, um, if you're a landlord, you're expected to be able to know whether you're looking at forged documents and that kind of thing. Um, so, so, you know, are, are, are we trying to protect the reputations of, of organisations in case they make the odd mistake, but it just blows them out of the water? I, I'm still grasping for reasons, um, but I just wondered if, 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 if that was part of the response that, that, that came. It's kind of the inverse of, 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 of what the noble lord there was, was referencing. Well, I appreciate um, the, the noble baroness's uh, intervention. And I do not have the answer to, to the question as to whether or not there, there, were, there was concern over reputational damage, but I don't personally see that as a particularly significant reason to withhold uh, one's identity. If you are an auditor of a corporate account, then you are, your name is, is public, and uh, as I'm sure has been found with some auditors relating to some national political parties, uh, their embarrassment uh, will be palpable, um, but at least this is public for us all to see. If, if I may... Um, allow, sorry, if, if I can just answer um, the, this other, the other point raised by the noble baroness on, uh, on penalties. There are, um, uh, it is an offence to falsely confirm uh, the identity of an individual, just so you're aware of that, and, and I'm, I'm not um, able to make comparisons with the private uh, landlord uh, sector, but uh, it's very clear that um, uh, to, to false, falsely identify uh, an individual would be a, would be a serious offence. Um, and uh, that is part of the legislation that we're providing for. So if I may go to Amendment 50A, um, I, I consider the measures included and added to the bill provide, provide a significant amount of, of transparency, and I will come on to discuss this in a moment. Um, to look at the, the uh, process that allows uh, uh, an individual to become an authorised corporate service provider, they, they have to be supervised under the money laundering regulations. They are already required under the money laundering regulations to take appropriate steps to identify and assess the risk that their customers would have on their business. 
And while I understand the noble lord's intention, I do not think that this is the right place to consider publishing information about risk assessment processes. It is, it is, in our view, beyond the role of the registrar to gather and store this information or to question it. I will just keep, keep going if, if I would be allowed. The right place for considering the quality of risk assessment is through, the money, laundering, uh, is through money laundering supervision. Supervisors are already empowered to compel this information and take enforcement action against firms found to be non-compliant. And I, and I have heard well and loud the comments around the money laundering process and whether or not the supervision, supervision regime is adequate. And there is a review being undertaken at the moment, which has been raised uh, in one of the amendments we are about to cover. So it would make sense to ensure that, that around that review, the discussions in terms of how um, the ACFP, ACSPs were monitored uh, was included. If I may, I'd like to turn to the Noble Lord's suggestions concerning standard industrial classification, or SIC codes, and publication of this information. So SIC codes allow companies' house to track what a business does and are primarily used to indicate emerging trends and the strength of the UK economy. I support the Noble Lord's intention to have clear information about the activities that companies are undertaking. And indeed, it is through this bill the government is extending the requirements to provide an SIC code to limited partnerships, SIC code provision, as uh, the Noble Lord Lee rightly pointed out, is already obligatory for companies. Companies House already run reports on how SIC codes are being used and will be capable of filtering these to show only the SIC codes of companies that are registered by ACSPs, for example, and I therefore consider that requiring ACSPs to provide this information as well would actually be duplicative. I also consider it disproportionate to require ACSPs to provide annual reports to the registrar on the SIC codes associated with the companies that they have registered. It is possible that thousands of ACSPs will be registered and it would not be possible for these reports to be monitored regularly. This is the concern in terms of the cost and the burden to companies' house. Furthermore, and for, for me, this is a very relevant point, and it has been raised, and it doesn't negate the necessity to assess the process of SICs, but it is important when looking at it in the context of this debate. A company's SIC code can and often does change, and there is a great deal of, of uh, I don't know what necessarily the word would be, um, greyness, is that a good word, about how people classify their, uh, their business activities. Uh, in my uh, investment career, I have looked at a tank company that was classified as a consumer discretionary. And I have seen a, a military defense business that had a lingerie subsidiary. Whether that was relating to some form of distraction for the enemy, I'm still trying to work it out. But the point is, it's very difficult in many cases to be absolutely certain as to the occupational or, or the classification of a business and relating to comments made by noble lords about companies obfuscating their actions, this doesn't necessarily provide us with a solution to that. Um, and it is not necessarily the role of the ACSP or Companies House to determine the specific validity of every claim made. I think that would be extremely difficult, uh, in particularly in cases where there are grey areas around activities. So that change may or not be presented by an ACSP. It would be unreasonable to expect an ACSP to be responsible for monitoring this. So I'm not actually clear as to the benefits that this amendment would bring and request that the noble lord does not move it. But I'm very happy to have a further discussion about SIC codes if that comes within the Department for Business and Trade, which it probably does. And at the same time, I'm very happy to have further discussions with noble lords as to the uh, review of the money laundering um, processes and supervisional uh, environment. I, I very much look forward to those discussions and I, I certainly wouldn't want uh, the, uh, the reporting burden here to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, <laughs> however, uh, I, I do think that the, uh, if we have a problem with companies misallocating their codes, is the noble lord, the minister, saying that it's up to the company to determine its code, or is it the registration body that is registering it that determines the code? Because if the registration body is deliberately miscoding companies, we have a problem. If companies are foolishly misqualifying themselves, 
uh, we have a different type of problem. But either way, we have a problem. Uh, and the minister seems to be saying that there isn't a problem in either case. Could he just confirm what the situation is? I, I appreciate the noble lord's uh, intervention. As far as I'm aware, and I'm comfortable to be corrected, uh, as I'm surrounded by so many experts in this matter, it is the company that classifies itself rather than the ACSP. So if that is not correct, then I will certainly come back to noble lords. And I repeat again, we, we are very happy to look at the issue of industry classification. Um, and I think this is very important uh, in terms of understanding, as I say at the beginning of my point about this amendment, uh, the growth of the economy and new industry classifications and how businesses are performing at the very least separate to the opportunity it will give Companies House to assess high-risk areas. If I may now turn to Amendment 50B in the name of the noble Lord, Lord Coker. Uh, I understand um, this, but I, I cannot support uh, this uh, amendment. Information on the money laundering and terrorist financing risks associated with the, with the TCSP sector, which is a, the trust and company service provider sector, is already published in the National Risk Assessment of Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing. Risk assessment undertaken by firms on their clients can be shared with money laundering supervisors who are responsible for reviewing them as part of their supervision of TCSP policies, controls and procedures. With respect to the proposal to provide information about the fees that they charge, I remind the Noble Lords that ACSPs are themselves businesses or consultants which are part of a market economy. It would not be reasonable in our view, to expect ACSP to disclose this information. And there is nothing in this bill which would oblige an individual to have their identity verified by an ACSP. Individuals will be at liberty to decide whether to pay any fee that an ACSP decides to charge or to use the service that will be provided by Companies House. And I'm confident that if a pros prospective customer considers an ACSP's fees to be too high, we can trust them to vote with their feet so, if I may turn to Amendment 51A, also in the name of the Noble Lord, Lord Coker, uh, the amendment uh, is well-intentioned. Uh, we've covered this to some extent already, but I will go through um, these points just to make sure that we are complete. I don't agree it will add value. There are over 600 SIC codes which are used to inform economic trends, Trying to adapt their usage for the purpose of fighting economic crime is unlikely to be successful. I'm unclear as to how the government would determine which SIC codes would be classified as high risk or how they could be applied fairly. Perfectly legitimate lower risk so-called businesses would almost certainly be inappropriate labelled as high risks. And I hope I have covered the other points relating to standard industry classification codes. Amendment 54 put forward by Lord Vaux, Baroness Bowles, Baroness Bennett of Manor Castle. And I'm, I'm grateful to the noble lords for this amendment. And as I say, I hope I have covered the points raised in enough detail to satisfy the noble lords present today that there will be a significant amount of work and inquiry placed around that amendment. If I may turn to Amendment 49 in the name of Lord Agnew of Alton. This is the blocking the use of ACSPs until HMT supervisory, supervisory reforms have taken place. Now, I think it would be disproportionate to block all ACSPs from carrying out identity checks while the Treasury works through its reforms to the supervisory regime, which I have just discussed, hopefully will conclude around the summer of this year. This would have a disproportionate effect on the thousands of high street accountants, solicitors and their business clients who operate entirely legitimately. And I would remind the Noble Lord that ACSPs will be required to carry out checks to at least the same standard as the Registrar, and that she'll be keeping an audit trail of their activity and be able to query any activity that she thinks suspicious, that she'll be able to share information with the ACSP supervisor and that she'll be able to suspend or deauthorize an ACSP, preventing it from conducting identity verification. A delay in allowing ACSPs to carry out identity checks could also impact other areas of reform. For example, limited partnerships will be required to make certain filings via an ACSP and may wish to have their identity checks done simultaneously by an ACSP. The bill also already provides for secondary legislation to be made which would allow spot checks to be carried out by the Registrar under Section 1098H in Clause 65. 
And I am confident that if any rogue agents do slip through the net, they will soon be spotted by a company's house who will have the power to take appropriate action. And in all honesty, I see no merit in delaying ACSPs from making identity checks and beginning this important process of bringing transparency and clarity to the register at company's house. If I could turn now to Amendment 48A in the name of Lord Coker. And I thank my noble friend for his amendment. I understand its purpose is to prevent the possibility of an ACSP being used to verify an identity where one already exists. However, in our view, the amendment is not necessary. An individual should not be able to have more than one verified identity. That would defeat the purpose of identity verification. I'd like to make clear that while individuals might verify their identity directly or using an ACSP, only companies' house will be able to allocate unique identifiers. We already have a regulation-making power in the Companies Act, which is being expanded by this bill, which can achieve what the noble peer proposes. Under Section 1082 of the Companies Act 2006, the Secretary of State will be able to make regulations, which could require that a statement of a person's UID, or lack thereof, is included in any document delivered to the registrar such as a verification statement delivered by an ACSP. This will help us double down on the system that Companies House will implement and make it as robust as possible. Companies House are developing mechanisms to prevent individuals from having more than one unique ID. I think this is worth emphasising. Additionally, if an ACSP has verified an individual's identity, they'll be required to inform Companies House which checks they've undertaken and to store records relating to the checks. These systems should intercept the type of activity about which the noble lord and indeed all of us are concerned. If I, if I may turn to Amendment 51, I hope I'm in the, the right order. We have one more amendment, Amendment 52, of uh, the amendments that I'm hoping to cover in this section. I now turn to Amendment 51, also tabled by my noble friend, Lord Agnew, which would require Companies House to conduct risk assessments on ACSPs and to request and review documents in relation to the identity checks an ACSP would undertake. To some extent, I believe I've already covered that uh, in my last few comments. We think these measures will be duplicative. The entities that would be ACSPs will already be subject to risk assessments by their supervisors. Not only would this therefore be an ineffective use of resource, but it would also have the effect of turning Companies House into a regulator. By the way, this is something that has come up over the last few weeks of discussion around this bill. The Companies House is a, is a, is a repository for information that, that we wish to make as accurate, clear and transparent as possible. It is, it is not a regulator uh, of ACSPs. It is not their role, and fr frankly, certainly not, not, in, not in this bill do we intend it to be. I am confident that the powers set out in the bill will give the registrar the powers she needs to ensure. Mm, yes. um, does the minister think that there is a case for there being some form of regulation of ACSPs, or does he think that that is not needed? Well, I'm very grateful for the intervention of the Lord, uh, as with all interventions today. Um, the ACSPs are already supervised. Uh, by their supervisor, which is the, the money laundering super, supervisory authority. Um, sh should, should there be a discussion over uh, some type of um, more effective uh, oversight in the view of this House over ACSPs, we, we, will, we will discuss this, no doubt, uh, in the future. But as it currently stands, they are regulated. And if, if any noble lord is, is involved with such a business or has a financial services business or has been involved in financial services, we, you know, you will, one will know, noble lords will know, the strength of the regulator and the fear uh, in which decent law-abiding firms hold their regulator when it comes to enacting the necessary practices to perform their, their duties and, and tasks. I, if I may turn to the last amendment that I have in my notes, which is Amendment 52, um, put forward by Lord Coker, Lord Ponsonby and Baroness Blake, which would require a report on foreign ACSPs to be made one year after this Act is passed. Um, I do not consider this amendment to be necessary. Uh, the main reason being that colleagues in the other place have already agreed to the addition of Clause 187 to the bill, requiring the Secretary of State to prepare reports on the implementation and operation of parts 1 to 3 of this bill and lay a copy of this before Parliament within six months of the Act being passed and every 12 months thereafter. Since authorised corporate service providers are provided for in Part 1 of the bill, they should already be captured for the reasons... Therefore, I, I would not support these amendments. would ask that the noble lords withdraw them. 
kept a bit of that as I was by the tip of his toes. I couldn't quite, it wasn't quite clear if he's saying that he is prepared to write to us about proposals of the SIC codes or meet with us or both. Uh, I, I totally accept it. That it, it's, it's, it is within the scope of the, of the bill and certainly within the scope of the purpose of the bill, but it is an extra exercise, an extra burden. But nonetheless, I wonder whether or not he feels uh, it's something he could take on. And I'm grateful to my noble friend for raising this point, and I hope I haven't overpromised. Uh, personally, I'm very keen to make sure that every part of the bill is discussed, uh, and I'm very happy to um, ensure that the right office, which in this case is the Office for National Statistics, which falls under uh, the Treasury rather than the Department for Business and Trade. Um, and I will certainly make sure that uh, the comments that we have raised in the debate today are passed on to them. And I'm sure they would welcome um, involving themselves in this, uh, in this discussion. And, and I, would like to make a, I would like to make a correction, if I may. Uh, the consultation um, on the money laundering oversight regime will uh, begin in the summer, uh, not conclude in the summer. My, my apologies for that. He sits down. I, I just <laughs> didn't want him to leave this process um, with the concept that we were entirely satisfied with his answer on the regulation of ASCPs. Thank you. Because the multiplicity of those regulators and, frankly, the vari variability of those regulators, never mind uh, the absence of any um, structure or indeed um, um, template, which I think the Noble Lord Ag Agnew's um, uh, amendment kind of suggest so I think I think if if the noble lord will can continue to keep that in his uh, in his list of things to think about uh, at the end of this session I'm grateful to for that uh, comment can I just clarify I, I'm sorry for hesitating because I'm sort of in shock uh, has the noble or the minister just told us that he's not going to have consultations with us about so many of these points but we're going to be talking to the office for national statistics about them well, I'm, 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 I hope that the noble lord didn't misunderstand my point. Uh, I think I referenced the fact that I assumed that um, SICs would fall under the Department for Business and Trade. Um, it turns out that that is not the case. I was mistaken in my knowledge of, uh, of, of departmental structures. It turns out it's under the Office of National Statistics, which is under the, uh, the Treasury. So it would be wrong for me to suggest um, uh, too, too much consultation on account of the fact that's not my department. But what I have committed to uh, is to make sure that we have further discussions around this. It's clearly very important. And if we're to make the, the function of SICs work properly, then they need to be seen to be effective, they need to be seen to be useful. So I'm very comfortable to commit to ensure that there is a, a suitable discussion that's held around that. And I'd be delighted, as I said, to arrange uh, to make sure that the relevant officials are brought before uh, the noble laws to have a further discussion around how that could possibly be affected. But clearly I can't commit another department to, to a specific activity. Will the minister be part of those, joining those discussions, or is he absenting himself from them? Oh, well, I, I thank the Lord for the point. I very much look forward to those discussions. Excellent. I would, I would, I would have to be dragged away uh, from, <laughs> from, from such discussions, uh, unless it turns out uh, that it is inappropriate that I should attend any part, any part of them. I, I, I can't promise to drag the noble lord anywhere, but uh, I do. I also look forward to those discussions. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, noble friend, the Minister, you, you very comprehensively dismissed my amendments, but earlier on in the conversation you had committed to talking, thinking much more carefully about bringing much more transparency to the regime that oversees the ACSPs. I just wanted to make sure that's the case. I just want to offer a couple more anecdotes of why I believe this is so important. So the former Chief Executive of HMRC, Sir Jonathan Thompson, question the whole role of HMRC in regulating these people. He, he, he didn't uh, understand or wasn't prepared to accept that anti-money laundering duties were, were part of the core activities of HMRC. And then, as I gave in earlier my examples of, of all the failings of the oversight by HMRC, the Financial Action Task Force review uh, said that there were significant weaknesses amongst all supervisors and specifically re recommended that HMRC should consider how to ensure appropriate intensity of supervision. 
So my point is that Companies House is going to be relying on what I believe to be a broken regulator at the moment. I'm not suggesting that we create a new regulator, but in terms of my second amendment, number 51, that's why I think the risk assessment is so important, because it is a way of, you know, who is minding the minders? Because at the moment, nobody seems to be. It's all moving at a glacially slow pace, and we keep being told that everything's okay. And I don't think everything is okay. So I accept that the protocol is I must withdraw my amendments, but I would like a slightly stronger commitment from my noble friend that he really is going to kick to tyres on this uh, and, and lift a few drain covers if I should mangle my, um, <laughs> my, uh, my acronyms. I appreciate my noble friend's uh, mixed metaphors. Uh, and I hope I have been clear that the um, process around making sure that the ACSPs operate in an environment that is trusted and clear is at the very root of much of the activity that we're discussing today. And uh, I will certainly make myself available for further in inquiry, but as I have hopefully made clear, they are regulated by the money laundering supervisory uh, authorities, uh, and uh, the, the review will begin in the summer around um, that important, uh, important process. I'd like to thank all noble lords who've, who've spoken in this uh, fairly long debate, actually, and, and for their support. Once again, um, consensus seems to have broken out around the committee, uh, which has got to be a good thing. Noble Lord, Lord Agnew, in particular, has dramatically set out the scale of this problem, and, and I think we, we all stand around it. Um, like him and like Noble Lord, Lord Fox, I have to confess I felt the noble lord was rather complacent around his views on the efficacy of the uh, anti-money laundering regulations as they stand at the moment. The Treasury review is welcome. Uh, it's been hanging around and talked about for quite a long time now, and that it's only starting in the summer is somewhat alarming, I have to say. Um, we, we need to fix what is a broken system. Uh, talking to the Institute of Chartered Accountants, they, they, they surprise me by telling me that the vast majority of accountancy firms are not regulated by the Institute of Chartered Accountants. It, it is not consistent and it really doesn't work well. It's an area we've got to improve. Um, at the outset of, this, of, t the, of our de debates today, the Noble Lord said that he is uh, open to constructive and practical suggestions for improvement, and, and I think we're all grateful for that. In this group, we have a number of simple suggestions that add little or no burden to either the registrar or business, and which I think could make a genuine practical difference. Um, the Noble Lord was, was quite right when he said the vast majority of ACSPs are diligent and honest and that it's an important industry and, and, and it's worth repeating that. I am sure that that vast majority would like to see the poor minority driven out of the business and stop giving them a bad name. Um, so I'm disappointed, I have to say, that the Noble Lord can't accept some or all of these amendments today, but I am grateful for his confirmation that he will consider them seriously. And I look forward to the promised discussions that he, he has uh, agreed to, to have. Uh, and therefore, on that basis, and for now, uh, although we will come back to this report, I am absolutely certain, I beg leave to withdraw my amendment. Thank you. It's your Lordship's pleasure this amendment be withdrawn. The amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 48A, Lord Coker, not moved. Amendment 49, Lord Agnew, not moved. Not moved. Um, in uh, Clause 64, Amendment 50, Lord Coker. Uh, 50, I think. <laughs> um, my Lord, this will be a much uh, more brief uh, group. Um, we will be speak. Uh, the purpose of Amendment 50 is to ensure that identity documents, um, that an identity document with a photograph of the individual's face and an identity document issued by a regular, recognized official authority form part of the registrar's identity verification procedure. The amendment specifically allows for two separate documents to be used to identify people rather than just limiting it, limiting it to, for example, a passport or driving license. An identity identity 
verification procedure that involves photographic ID is explicitly committed to in the Corporate Transparency White Paper, page 43, and reflects international best practice guidelines. What reasoning does the government have for weakening this aspect of the verification process? The government clearly believes that in the case of voting, voting in local elections, um, there should be photographic ID. Why not make it explicitly part of the process here? I beg to move. Line 13, it ends, insert the words printed on the marshalled list. My Lords, um, in the last group, I did ask the Noble Lord what he was intend what the government was intending in terms of regulation around ID verification. The bill allows for the, the Secretary of State to create regulations as to what the ID verification process would be. He didn't actually answer that question then. This seems like a convenient moment for him to do so. Exactly said, uh, said what I was going to say is. If not this, what is the, the process to identify people then, and the documentation required? But uh, uh, it will be interesting to hear the, the Minister's response to the Noble Lord Ponsonby's uh, challenge on, on if it's good enough for the voter in the local elections, uh, why not for the multi-million pound company? <coughs> I support this uh, amendment, but there is a slight irony because I think the Labour Party is actually against the provision that uh, they're now relying on in, in support of this amendment. Uh, and, and notwithstanding that cheap debating point, it does seem to me that it's quite useful, and I can't see an obvious reason why we shouldn't have this. Uh, further irrelevance to the. Uh, no, not further irrelevance, just to add a. a <laughs> I apologise to my. <laughs> I apologise to my. Uh, noble friend, uh, I'm pleased that uh, Lord Punsonby and the Labour Party have tabled this amendment because when we were debating identity cards in the dim and distant days when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, uh, one of the great things that the, the then Labour government stressed was that there should be a, f a photograph of the person in question, but they didn't say it should be of the person's face. And so it enabled <laughs> cheeky members of the opposition uh, to tease uh, the, I'm not, not sure whether Lord Coker was a, a Home Office Minister at the time, but we had a great deal of fun <laughs> working out which part of the identified person's anatomy should uh, form the main part of the photograph. But I'm, I'm happy to say that Lord Pansonby has obviously learnt from that uh, hideous experience, uh, and uh, this seems to be an altogether better uh, set of proposals. Well, I, I thank the Noble Lords, uh, Lord Coker and Lord Ponsonby, and the Noble Baroness Lady Bake for Amendment 50, which, as has been discussed, seeks to require that the new identity verification process includes the use of photographic ID issued by a recognised authority. Although I welcome our shared ambition to ensure that identity verification will be a robust process, uh, I am concerned about their proposed approach of limiting the acceptable documents in primary legislation. The procedure for identity verification, including what evidence will be required, will be set out in secondary legislation under Clause 64 of this bill. And I apologise always for not answering uh, Noble Lord's uh, questions. And, and Lord Vaux raised that uh, I had dodged the question the first time. And I hope I'm not dodging the question the second time. But, but I would certainly be delighted to write to Noble Lords with some further information as to the specific detail that is required for identity verification, which, which let me be very clear, we assume will, will in include a photograph. Um, however, let me just come on to explain why that may not be the, necessarily be the case in every instance. Setting out this in secondary legislation will allow for flexibility and ensure the technical detail of the identity verification process can be adapted to meet evolving industry standards and technological developments. Parliament will have the opportunity to scrutinise these regulations via the affirmative procedure. I can assure noble laws that for the majority of individuals, photographic ID will be used. The primary identity verification route will be via the so-called selfie verification method, which will involve the person providing documents such as a passport or driving license. The person undergoing identity verification will take a photograph or scan of their face. Lord, Lord, my noble friend may be pleased to have such specificity 
and the identifying document. The two will be compared using likeness matching technology and the identity verified. However, I am concerned that the amendment proposed would exclude individuals who do not have photographic ID. Restricting the acceptable documents could inadvertently discriminate against a number of people and raises equality concerns. For example, would it be fair for the law to prevent individuals from setting up a company simply because they do not have a passport or a driving license? Should, should an individual who has owned the freehold of their home for decades via a company now be forced to apply for photographic ID despite no other statutory requirement to have one? This is why for individuals who cannot provide such documentation, there will be alternative options available. I can assure this House that these will be robust and proportionate. Most importantly, all providers will conduct checks in line with the cross-government identity proofing framework, the GPG45, and so will be comparable to verification checks conducted elsewhere in government. And under the GPG45 framework, a combination of non-photographic documents, including government, financial and social history documents, can be accepted to achieve a good level assurance of identity. ID documentation from an authoritative source such as the financial sector or local authorities is also recognised under the cross-government identity proofing framework and is routinely used to build a picture of identity. So for the reasons I have set out, I hope the Noble Lords uh, will understand the, the philosophy of my approach um, but agree that requiring in primary legislation that an individual provide official photographic ID to verify their identity would be unnecessarily restrictive and potentially unfair. And I'm afraid I would therefore ask the Noble Lords to withdraw their amendment. My Lords, I thank the Noble Lord the Minister for that serious answer to the uh, amendment which I uh, have just moved. And um, I also um, am grateful that he has said that the intention of the government is to harmonise the identity checking methods across a number of different uh, 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 parts of the government process, if I, if I can put it like that. And I do acknowledge that the technology for ident identifying individuals is evolving um, and that photography itself is, is not the end of the story and that, that part of the identify and identification process is evolving as well. Um, I think I will reflect on the Noble Lord's um, answer to that point. I need to look at other pieces of legislation and see whether on other bills there is... Um, it is explicitly put uh, on the face of the bill um, the, 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 the way identity is going to be checked. Nevertheless, I do, um, as I say, I, I do thank the Noble Lord for the serious way he's answered the, the points I've raised, and I beg leave to withdraw my amendment. It's a pleasure that this amendment be withdrawn. The amendment is by leave withdrawn. The question is that Clause 64 stand part of the bill. As many as ask, can you all say contempt? It's contrary, not contempt. The contents have it. Amendment 50A, uh, Lord Cromwell, not moved? Not moved. Uh, Amendment 50B, Lord Coker, Lord Ponsonby, not moved? Not moved. Uh, Amendment 51, Lord Agnew, not moved? Not moved. Uh, Amendment 51A, Lord Coker, not moved? Uh, the question is that Clause 65 stand part of the bill. As many as that, can you all say content? No. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. Uh, Amendment 52, Lord Coker, not moved. Uh, the question is that Clause 66 stand part of the bill. As many as that, can you all say content? No. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. In Clause 67, Amendment 53, Lord Borks. Uh, my Lords, I rise to move Amendment 53. Um, hopefully we can be fairly brief on this one. Uh, it's related in a way to uh, the Amendment 48A uh, in the name of Lord Coker that we spoke about earlier, but it attacks the issue of um, uh, unique identifiers from, from the opposite direction, effectively. Clause 67.3 ensures that the unique identifiers allocated to companies and others, including the ACSPs, are not available on the public register. Now, I was rather surprised to find this. Um, so this amendment really is a probing amendment to find out the rationale for hiding unique identifiers and to discuss whether that's the right thing to do. It seems to me that the unique identifier would be a very helpful tool to, to assist civil society organisations, journalists, analysts, and indeed AML regulators 
to discover trends and connections in the information held on companies on the, on the register. One person could easily have a number of versions of names, uh, you know, simply A. Jones, Andrew Jones, A. J. Jones, and so on. It's not necessarily dishonest. Uh, I have two names myself. I have the title and I have my real name. Uh, I hope that's not dishonest. Um, it would make it much easier to search using the unique identifier and would avoid the problems of having potentially multiple names or, or versions of names and people being missed off. Um, it would allow uh, an AML regulator to quickly search for all situations where a particular AC ACSP has acted, or a journalist to identify ACSPs who act regularly for companies in particular industries, and to be sure that they've caught all the instances. When I met with the Minister previously, for which I thank him again, he, he explained that unique, unique identifier is used as the login for the relevant entity. If that's the case, I do understand why it shouldn't be public, but I would strongly question whether that's sensible. Very few organisations would use a number like a unique identifier for login purposes. It would go against commonly accepted security practices. The government doesn't do it in other systems, as far as I'm aware. So would it not make more sense for the unique identifier to be public and therefore useful and to allow the greatest transparency I've described and to have a more secure method of logging into companies' house accounts? I beg to move. Subsection 3. Briefly on this, because uh, I, I think key to this is what is the purpose of the unique identifier, because I, I was uh, perhaps like the Noble Lord Vox, thinking that it was something that you, you was like the resource identifier that you used for searching. Um, I mean, I know that if you search on my name, you don't find all my directorships. I keep amending my name to try and make sure they're all the same, but you still can't find them in Companies House. So I was thinking that it was, it was a better way than perhaps names of finding out um, all the companies that everybody was doing and that, and that, and that kind of thing. But I, I, I can see if it's more of the login uh, type of approach, then, then that might be different. Uh, but that then begs the question, is, isn't there a better way actually of identifying companies and individuals that, that, that works on the searchers? Because simply going by name is, uh, I mean, too many times there are minor variations and then it, it won't, won't flag up if you're trying to search to see if somebody is doing something in a... In a, in a in a different company or you know how many directorships that they've got so i'm i'm, I'm like like, like uh, the noble lord Vox, i'm curious as to what the purpose of this identifier is and and therefore why why it is confidential So I, I thank uh, the noble lord, uh, Lord Hawkes, for his amendment. 53. Unique identifiers are, a unique, are unique codes allocated on an individual basis. So the bill will allow unique identifiers to support the effective operation of identity verification, such as allowing companies' house to link an individual's verified identity across multiple roles and companies. The way I like to look at it is it, is it's, is it operates as a username. And I think that's important. This, this isn't a, a public uh, number. This is, this, is a, this is a private number that the individual will have allocated to them. And I'd like to reassure the noble Baroness Lady Bowles of Burke Hampstead and the noble Lord Lord Vaux of Harridan that this amendment is not necessary to achieve the objectives that they have described. Although I am concerned about um, Lady, the noble Baroness Lady Bowles of Burke Hampstead's uh, um, difficulty in tracing herself in the records of Companies House. This will be a very good test as to whether or not the systems do work. But Companies House will be making changes to how members of the public view the register so that although the unique identifiers themselves will not be public, it, it will be possible to see accurately connections between individuals and entities. And if I may say that's absolutely at the, at the central point of the reforms being made to Companies House. This includes how many companies and individuals a director or person with significant control for. Uh, from my own personal experience of using the Companies House database, I do come up uh, under the various different uh, forms of, of my name, you know, D. Johnson or Dominic Johnson or D. R. A. Johnson or whatever it 
whatever it may be. Um, and uh, it, it, it does work in, in this instance, but uh, it is absolutely right for, for noble lords to be concerned about whether or not the system will work, and we've undertaken to make sure that it does, and it's at the cornerstone um, of our activities and everything that this bill is pointing towards. Regulations made under Section 1082 will govern the use of unique identifiers. We intend to prevent individuals from having more than one unique identifier, as the name would denote. And anyone submitting a statement with an incorrect unique identifier will commit a false filing offence. Furthermore, the primary purpose of a unique identifier is to allow its owner to communicate securely and privately with companies' hats. As I say, this should be looked upon as a username. And unique identifiers can be considered personal data, and making them public could expose the registrar to data protection breach risks in the same way that it would be inappropriate to publish individuals' national insurance numbers. So that there is a significant privacy element around this. So we will be, you know, we, we, one is looking at some very sensitive, complex information. We have to make sure that we protect people's security. Otherwise, they will be open to similar sorts of fraud that we see them already exposed to. So making unique identifiers public would compromise their use, as they could be appropriated and misused by anyone looking at the register including potentially to commit identity fraud and other crimes. So, so whilst, if I may say, and I use this term sincerely, well-intentioned, uh, we believe this amendment would weaken rather than strengthen the government's efforts to tackle economic crime. Uh, I hope this provides reassurance, and the noble Lord, Lord Vaux, will kindly uh, withdraw this amendment. I thank the noble Lord for that helpful answer. Uh, I am somewhat reassured. Um, I think the, the use sort of behind the scenes of the unique identifier to make sure that the connections between different names allow uh, all the names to be displayed if you're searching for, for, for one person will be important. Um, I guess it will be worth, see, we, we will see how, it, how well it works in practice and from what I understand from what the Noble Lord said, the regulation, the, 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 the Secretary of State will have the power to make changes to this by regulation if it's not working properly. Uh, and on that basis, I beg leave to withdraw my amendment. Is the amendment be withdrawn? The amendment is by leave withdrawn. The question is that Clause 67 stand part of the bill. As many as of that opinion will say content. No. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. In Clause 68, Amendment 54, Lord Borgs, not moved. Not moved. The question is that Clause 68 stand part of the bill. As many of that opinion will say content. No. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that clauses 69 to 76 be agreed to uh, stand part of the bill en bloc. As many as that opinion will say content. No. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. In clause 77, Amendment 55, Lord Lee. Not moved, not moved. Um, the question is that clause 77 stand part of the bill. As many as that opinion will say content. No. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that clauses 78, 79 and 80 stand part of the bill. As many as of that opinion will say content. Okay. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. In clause 81, amendment 56, already debated, Lord Johnson moved formally. The question is that amendment 56 be agreed to. As many as of that opinion will say content. Okay. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that Clause 81, as amended, uh, stand part of the bill. As many as of that opinion will say content. No. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. Uh, in Clause 82, Amendments 57 and 58, Lord Lee, not moved. Um, the question is that Clause 82 stand part of the bill. As many as of that opinion will say content. No. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that clauses 83 to 85 inclusive stand part of the bill, as many of that opinion will say content. Right. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. In clause. You only went to clause 85, we need to go to 88. Did I miss 85? You said 85, we need to do 6, 7, 8. 86, 87, and 88. 83 to 88 was what I thought I said. Mm -hmm. Have I have I have I mistaken? 83 to 88 is what I wrote down, but not what I said. Okay. Is that what is that what is the case? Yes. In which case, I apologise to the committee, and we'll try again. Clauses 83 to 88, inclusive, stand part of the bill. As many as of that opinion will say, content. Okay. To the contrary, not content. 
the contents of it. In clause 89, my lords, uh, amendments 59, 60, 61 and 62 already debated. Lord Johnson moved formally. The question is that amendments 59, 60, 61 and 62 be agreed to en bloc. As many as are of that opinion will say content. No, no. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that clause 89 as amended stand part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. No, no. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. Uh, in clause 90, amendment 63, Lord Agnew not moved? Not moved. Uh, the question is that uh, clause 90 stand part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. No. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is, clause 91 stand part of the bill as minister of that opinion will say content. To the contrary, not content. The contents have it. After clause 91, amendment 64, Lord Coker. Uh, um, it's a pleasure to um, address you for the first time this afternoon and just to say uh, a couple of things. that uh, The theme of the uh, discussions and debates earlier on was uh, transparency and Lord Volk's made an outstanding speech, I thought, into why transparency uh, was important. And many other noble lords then talked about this being the once in a lifetime opportunity for this parliament to uh, progress in a way that perhaps we've been slow to progress uh, and uh, led to many of the things that Lord Agnew pointed out in his remarks um, as to the exploitation of the economic laxness and business laxness there was uh, in London and beyond, uh, which has led to things that all of us would. Deplore. So the bill gives us a real uh, opportunity uh, to tackle that. And the theme and the, the, the Minister's response really is, is crucial to this for us to determine what we may wish to push the government on uh, in report. Uh, but we've now moved from transparency um, to reporting and how the bill is going to be implemented and how effective the bill will be uh, in that case. So hence my movement uh, moving um, uh, claw, uh, amendment rather 64 in my name and that of Lord Ponsonby and Baroness Blake uh, and to support also uh, uh, um, Amendment 72 in the name of Lord Agnew, Lord Cromwell, Lord Garnier and Baroness Bowles which effectively uh, is, uh, is virtually uh, the same. Um, I would say in the government, I know the Minister's notes will tell him that there's no need to worry about this because you can just get up and tell Coco that it's irrelevant. Uh, that is no need for this because we've, uh, at the end of uh, the House of Commons, uh, the government proved it was a listening government and has introduced Clause 187, which, if we read all of that, noble laws will have seen it, talks about reports on the implementation of the operation of Parts 1 to 3. And indeed, uh, I hadn't realised Lord Johnson was as radical uh, as he is, but actually, if you read parts of it, it actually takes some of the amendments uh, that uh, myself and other noble Lords and Baronesses have put and actually includes it in the clause that the government uh, have got. But I refer to Lord Johnson's uh, radicalness because in my amendment, uh, in uh, part um, three, I say that the first report must be published within one year of this act being passed. But uh, if we read uh, what uh, Lord Johnson has put before us, it says the first report must be laid within the period of six months uh, beginning. Uh, with the day on which this Act is passed. Well, it's good to see the Government moving further than they were pushed to, to do. But Lord Agnew, no doubt, uh, sorry, Lord Johnson had no doubt got that uh, in his notes. But the serious point I wanted to make is this. That of course, it's, it's good to see uh, Clause uh, 187 now included in the Bill uh, because it takes on board many of the points that have been raised in the amendments and the points that are made about the effectiveness of the way in which this bill will operate. Uh, the bill says many things that we would all agree with. What the concern is, of course, is whether it will be enforced, whether it will be proved to work in the way that the government, and indeed all of us, would wish it to. Uh, and so, hence, um, my uh, amendment and that of other, uh, uh, my noble friends, uh, seeks to actually uh, explore what the government means. Because it says, that, of course, in, its, uh, in Clause 187, uh, the, the Secretary of State must prepare reports. But in my amendment, which uh, is placing it after uh, Clause 91, what I'm seeking to do is to try to understand what that, uh, and say to the government, this is what uh, such a report should uh, include. And I don't see why 
uh, why, why we wouldn't actually report on the effective implementation of the bill. So if we look at uh, what I'm saying in, in Amendment 64, uh, to report on the way in which the objectives uh, laid out in the first clause are actually met. And we had the four objectives and we had a debate earlier on in committee uh, about how effective or not those uh, objectives were and whether the bill would meet them. And I would say that they are particularly important that, we, that these objectives are reported on, not just as some general report that the government lays before us, but there's a specific report, given the fact that in committee we debated long and hard about the why on earth uh, the, uh, the registrar uh, of companies would have an objective to minimise the risk rather than prevent the risk. And while the, in objective four it would have minimised the extent rather than uh, uh, prevent uh, it happening. So I would think that it's re especially important given the concerns that were raised in this committee about the loose language that the government were employing in its very first clause to determine the objectives of the registrar that we have a full and frank uh, report laid before Parliament on how effective the registrar has been in achieving the objectives as laid out in those four uh, objectives. So what I've sought to do in those reporting requirements is to say these are the sorts of things that the government should, uh, should be including. And it starts, as I say, with uh, that uh, uh, Amendment 64 uh, Part 1 uh, that I've put there. And it would be interesting to see what the government uh, thinks about that. Is this what is going to be included? And that's the question. After each of these various points that are down there, is this what the government is going to report on or not? Is this what the government is going to include in determining the effectiveness of this Act, or Bill of Acts as it will become? Is that what the government are going to do? I would have thought uh, actually assessing whether the objectives make any have been achieved or not is an absolutely fundamental part. So is that what the government will report on? Whether the objectives have been uh, achieved uh, uh, or not? Um, whether further legislation is needed? There's all sorts of regulations included in here. Uh, but, but again, uh, Noble Laws in the earlier debates referred this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Lord Garnier, I think, mentioned that, and he's quite right. Uh, if it wasn't Lord Garnier, it may have been Lord Lee, but certainly one, some, one of the Noble Laws re referred to the fact that it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Well, indeed it is, but I, you know, maybe it will identify gaps that the regulatory powers in the legislation uh, could seek to, uh, uh, to avoid. A breakdown of the annual... Uh, expenditure. We're going to have a debate or a discussion uh, in the next clause and beyond about fees and where that should go and how they should be used. It will give us an opportunity of seeing about uh, the annual expenditure. Where the charges for fees uh, should be amended. The government's got a regulatory making power, but maybe the report could uh, give the government some information uh, about that. The, the details, again, it goes back to the, 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 the steps the registrars take to promote the, red, uh, the objectives. And point E, the annual data uh, on the number of companies. How will we know what is going to happen without... So we don't want just bald statements. We want factual information so that we can base uh, any decisions that we make uh, on evidence. Uh, and uh, I think F is particularly important. Uh, where it, it, the annual data on the number of cases referred by the registrar to law enforcement and anti-money laundering supervisors. It's absolutely crucial that this Act has some teeth, that this Act is seen to be implemented, that this Act is seen to operate in a way which actually deters those who may wish to operate in a way which undermines the vast uh, majority of good business. Is, the, uh, is that the sort of thing that the government uh, is, is thinking of? So there's a whole range of different um, points uh, that have been raised there. These are the sorts of things that should be reported on. These are the sorts of things uh, that the government needs to reflect upon and allow Parliament to reflect upon to see how effective the Act has been in achieving the things that we all want it to achieve. As I say, in the later clause in the Bill, the government has said it is going to report. What this amendment will do is probe what the government actually means by that and what it seeks to include. And I think it would be helpful to the committee uh, for us to hear a little bit more about what the government thinks it's going to use 
uh, as a way of determining whether the Act has been successful in the way it wants or not. Thanks for move. Thank you. Member proposed uh, after Clause 91 insert the new clause printed on the Marshall list. Uh, my Lords, I just really, I don't want to speak for too long because I know Lord, Lord Coker has covered it very clearly and our amendments are very similar and indeed in a, in a spirit of collaboration I'd be delighted to give ground and for the, my noble friend to accept Lord Coker's amendment rather than my own. But I think there's a serious point to this is that my noble friend will know that in business what gets measured gets done and unless we are specific in the requirements of this annual report to Parliament, it will be fudged if, inf if the story isn't a good one. I mean, I've read you some extracts from the in internal HMRC report earlier. They absolutely hate putting the bad news out there and will use the, every bit of the English language to obfuscate as much as possible. So by putting a simple list of requirements that, that, we, are, that we expect to hear every year, we'll reduce that. It is really that simple. The other thing I notice in the government's own wording is they want to put a sunset clause on reporting in uh, 2030. But you know, I, I accept the principle of sunset clauses, but this isn't, uh, this isn't going to cost anything. This is information that the organisations themselves must have if they're going to function in a, any way professionally. So I think that is a very flawed idea. So I, I won't speak for longer than that, but I, I would like to hear from our noble friend why the government is so shy of actually reporting properly on this thing and learning some of the lessons that we have taken so hard over the last 10 years and actually making a clean slate of it. Um, as my name is, is, as with others, attached to this, express my sympathy uh, to uh, Amendment 72. My mm. Lords, a great deal was said mm. by the Noble Lord, the Minister and others in the previous day of debate about this, about the importance mm. of the guiding objectives uh, to be given to the Registrar. And I would mm. suggest that much of this bill, and in particular the majority mm. of the amendments that have been tabled, are attempts to give practical effect to those objectives. And I'm sure the Minister has, has, as he has already said, welcomes the engagement by all of us in, in seeking to achieve that. Um, reviewing an, in an annual report the adequacy of the powers and the progress, and including very importantly, as Lord Agnew has just outlined, quantitative measures, I would expect to be welcomed by uh, the Registrar and the Secretary of State. Um, such reporting is also a crucial part of reporting and being accountable to Parliament. Given that we're looking at a major overhaul of Companies House in this bill, again, it is essential that we have proper reporting on progress. There are a number of probing amendments uh, in this vein. Lord Cocos is, is clearly one of those. And I just hope that the government will perhaps take the opportunity, opportunity to blend these into a practical outcome. I too have put my name to... Um, my noble friend's amendment, 172, he's quite right. In business, what gets measured gets done. That's also true of politics. Uh, and one only has to set down a requirement and to have that requirement followed up and measured uh, to see an improvement in the performance of a government department or a, a public authority such as uh, a company's house. So uh, I entirely agree with the thoughts that were put forward by my noble friend and, and the noble Lord, Lord Cromwell uh, just now in support of this uh, amendment and indeed by Lord Coker in addressing his own amendment. Uh, for my own part, I don't necessarily think that we need to see uh, the terms of these amendments set out in legislation on the, on the face of the bill, but we do need a public recognition that the elements that Lord Coker spoke about and the elements that my noble friend uh, Lord Agnew has spoken about are publicly recognised as goals and things that will be measured and reported on annually. Uh, making annual reports uh, is something that is not only made by chairman of companies nowadays. The Lord Chief Justice makes uh, an annual report and various other public figures uh, dotted about our constitution, uh, make annual reports. So we shouldn't run shy 
of requiring that, and indeed Clause 187 of the Bill makes clear that the Secretary of State will make a report. But the main thing to do is to get the information out there regularly and publicly so that the public knows what is being done in its name. Uh, I, I support what others have said, and, and I think if you take these amendments as essentially the, um, one, uh, uh, Clause 187 needs to be amplified, um, like, like Lord Agnew, I don't see the reason for its sunsetting in 2030, given that that's not really that far away, given that um, although this might commence uh, immediately um, on, on, on royal assent, there are quite a lot of regulations and other things, and I don't know what the time scale of those are going to be before everything is up and running. So, uh, uh, as I saw it, um, Clause 187 is monitoring the progress and getting thing, everything up and running and, and, and seeing that it's okay, and then just saying, well, that's fine. But I, but I think there is a a case for ongoing monitoring to see what is changing um, and, and whether there is a need for any further update and, and the annual report seems to be a vehicle for that and like others I would say it was a good reason for it to continue uh, rather than for it to be um, sunsetted and if need be therefore <coughs> to perhaps list a few more of the things that it is going to be covering could stay silent on that as long as, because it, it's quite broad, talking about the implementation and operation of parts one to three, that, that, that's clause 187. Um, I, I think as long as that was, if you took away the sunset clause, then, then you know, maybe I, I think I could probably be quite satisfied. Uh, thank my noble friend for laying Amendment 187. I do think uh, it, it is. Um, a, a valid attempt to uh, achieve some of the aims of these amendments. I, I wholeheartedly agree, though, uh, that, that the sunset clause does puzzle me. Uh, what I would uh, just ask my noble friend to bear in mind is that the expertise that is being offered uh, by this committee and um, Lord, noble Lord Coker's Amendment 65 and the amendment of my noble friend, Lord Agnew, are attempting to assist, I think, the government in achieving the objectives that we all wish to see um, by injecting the difference between theory and practice. The government wants these um, measures to succeed, and I think what the committee is trying to suggest is that there are, in practice, uh, a number of measures which are identified in each of these uh, amendments, which of course could be combined, to guide those who are overseeing these or producing the reports as to what the important elements will be uh, if we want to make this work well. well um, in terms of timing, it, it's important to bear in mind that the genesis of much of this legislation can be found as long ago as 2015. So it takes a long time for anything to happen in terms of response to what was then identified as a major threat uh, of corruption, uh, which is permeating our society. Uh, eventually, we got the criminal finances bill. Then there were many promises um, of legislation which didn't materialize. Uh, then we, um, we had the uh, money laundering and sanctions bill, which dealt with some aspects of this. Then it took the invasion of Ukraine before we had the last piece of legislation. And now we have, eight years after the initiative in 2015, we have this piece of legislation which may or may not be the, the final chance. So keeping the government with respect up to the mark by a, an annual report and not having a sunset clause is something we should learn from the very uh, chronology that I've just described. My Lords, I uh, intended to um, sign uh, Amendment 72, but I was beaten in the stampede to support it, um, which must in itself say something about the, uh, the quality of the amendment. Um, amendment 64 in the name of uh, Lord Lord Coker is very similar, and I, I, like others, I think 
both include important elements, and it would be great to, to, to try to combine the best of both when we get to report stage. I shan't repeat what has already been said, but it does seem that adding this sort of level of transparency into the system must help in ensuring we've got this right. Um, if I could perhaps just quote the noble Lord, Lord Callanan, who said during the debates on uh, ECB1, the previous uh, economic crime bill, and I quote, when we introduced the provisions on PSCs, persons with significant control, in relation to UK companies, we had to make some iterative changes to that, as it became evident over time that aspects were not working as effectively as we had hoped. Well, my lords, the best way to see if things are not working as effectively as we had hoped is transparency and reporting. So I do hope the Noble Lord, the Minister, can accept this very simple and sensible amendment to promote that level of transparency. I'd make one just addition to the list of items uh, to report on that set out in the amendment, if I may. Given the importance of the ACSPs to the process, as we discussed in the previous group, I think it would be useful to include some statistics on the number of ACSPs that have been approved, both UK and foreign, and who they are regulated by, and the number who are suspended. But with that addition, I just wanted to add my support to these amendments. Well, <clears throat> as always, thanks, thanks I, I, I offer to the Noble Lords for their um, participation. And Lord uh, Coco, Lord Ponsonby, and Lord Baroness Lady Bowles for the, the amendment number 64. Uh, and I would also like to thank my noble friend, Lord Agnew, and uh, my learned friend, Lord Garnier, the Noble Lord, Lord Cromwell, as well as the Noble Baroness Lady Bowles for their amendment 72, if I've got that correct. Uh, these both address reporting requirements in very, um, in very similar ways and, have, and are very relevant and, uh, and important. I agree that it is important that Parliament is informed about the implementation and delivery of these reforms. And that is why the other place agreed to add an amendment to this effect to the Bill at Report stage, which Noble Lords have discussed. Companies House also re already reports on many of the items set out in this new uh, amendment and in many cases actually goes much further either through its annual report or via quarterly and annual statistical releases. Legislating to duplicate this and the newly re reporting duty at Clause 187 of the Bill seems to me to be unnecessary. Uh, it is important that any report is holistic and something which is of use to Parliament and the wider public. It should provide the necessary context to facilitate an informed view of performance, which would be difficult based solely on the raw data that some of these amendments propose. However, I do agree that some of the new items of data identified in this amendment could be of interest. And Lord Vaux, the noble lord, raised some specific points which I believe may already be covered in part in some of the quarterly filings. But in any event, if they are not, uh, they are certainly worthy of discussion. For example, and I'm happy to explore with companies, house officials, how they might incorporate these into their reporting without the need for this statutory re requirement. But it may be worth, just returning to some of Lord Coker's comments, uh, to cover some key points that, that were raised. So each report must provide an annual date, data on the number of cases referred to the registrar, to law enforcement bodies and anti-money laundering supervisors. As I understand it, this is already enabled via our amendment and is expected to be included. Each report must provide annual data on the total number of company incorporations to the registrar, number of company incorporations by authorised corporate service providers to the registrar. These incorporations are published quarterly via the statistical uh, release. Uh, each report must detail all instances in which exemption powers have been used by the Secretary of State. This is covered by the Government Amendment. Confirm that the registrar has sufficient financial resources to meet her objectives. The registrar's resources will continue to come from fees, but these will be set according to how much activity ministers want to be undertaken. And each report must provide annual data on the number of companies that have been struck off by the register, registrar, the number and amount of fines, removals from the registrar or are already reported on quarterly, and the number and value of late filing penalties are published in annual management information tables. Just, just to give Noble Lords reassurance that there is a great deal of detail already published and we will be looking to publish more uh, and I look forward to a discussion with Noble Lords as to some specific areas that we can cover and I'm sure that my officials are looking forward to those discussions because it is all about um, the sort of data that we provide that will allow us to uh, run an effective and transparent company system in this country. But I would be very reluctant 
to legislate specifically according to these amendments, given what I've said and our commitment to making sure that we are publishing useful information. Um, I would like to just cover the comments made by some noble lords relating to the um, supposed sunsetting of the requirements to report. As I understand it, and I may have misunderstood it, but I hope I haven't, um, the purpose of the uh, amendment and the, the, um, uh, the, the clauses in the bill that relate to the six months and then annual reporting is relating to the implementation of the changes in Companies House to bring it up to the standards at w which we wish to see it operating at, at which point uh, the reports will be included in, in, in annual and or regular reports. So it is not that the reporting ends, it, it, it becomes commonplace to report on the data rather than necessarily on the changes that we are instigating to Companies House. And I'm happy to make further clarification on that uh, if I haven't been accurate enough in my description. So, yes. It does say on the implementation and operation, and therefore I was hoping that there would be ongoing commentary, if you like, ongoing reporting on the operation. That, that, that's in, in clause 187, though I accept that because there is a sunset clause, it kind of did imply that it was about transient stuff, but I, uh, if, if the operation, uh, and it's ongoing operation, because it may be that it would break down, you don't know, uh, is included in other reports, I'd be satisfied. But if it's not, then I would still suggest that you needed to keep Clause 187 going. Well, I, I appreciate the noble Baroness's um, uh, point. And, as I say, the, the, um, sun, the sunsetting effectively becomes business as usual, uh, which is um, provided for uh, to enable the um, company's house to report according to the criteria that have been established. So, so I'm very happy to have discussions in terms of what data it is useful to provide. That's a very important, relevant, relevant point. I mean, I, I, my assumption is that will evolve over time. Uh, to some extent as well, but we can be pretty comfortable that there is already a great deal of information being provided. It may be useful for us to do an assessment of that and uh, then engage in further discussions with, with, with officials. We're, we're very open-minded um, in terms of the data that is provided. But I'm reluctant to make sure to, to, to legislate for this since we're trying to make data useful um, rather than necessary simply a, um, a legislative process. Clarify that. So, what, are you suggesting that, that to Baroness Bowles's point, you will clarify that this, because the, the wording is quite specific at 187 brackets little one operation, you're saying that you want this to drop away as part of a sunset clause, but there is another report which will endure, and you're going to discuss with us and hopefully make sure that that is fit for purpose for the longer term. Yes, I, I believe we'll have further discussions around that point, yes. When you replied to me, you've actually used the word data rather than operation, and there is a difference between data and operation. So, I mean, this may not be something that you can instantly resolve now, but the, the, the ongoing concern is not just about the data, but the operation of Companies House, and those are two different things. Thank you. I thank the noble lord for, for that uh, point. And there, there, are two, there are two separate components to that, one of which is the, the data and all, and all the requirements that have been tabled in, in these amendments, which are relevant to understanding the activities of Companies House and to make sure that we have a comprehensive assessment of, of what they are. Uh, the second point is that there is the assumption that uh, over the next six years, seven years, um, that Companies House will, will have reached its operational capability to deliver on providing the relevant data. Um, so we have a good deal of time to assess whether or not that's been achieved. There is uh, a sort of potential for Companies House to achieve its ambitions uh, before uh, 2030, at which point it would settle into business as usual uh, reporting. Uh, I would say, I think, uh, hey, uh, uh, no, Lord, the Minister, for for his uh, response, which uh, I think in some ways was helpful in terms of trying to clarify some of the things that uh, the government would expect to be included uh, in any report. But I think there will be a need to discuss with others. Uh, 64 and 72 are clearly very close, and I think we need to have a discussion about whether we need 
to push the government further uh, at reports uh, in terms of what the government actually means. I think there was some ambivalence, if I'm honest about it, in the government's, in the minister's response to uh, the sunset clause and uh, sub uh, 1871A, um, etc. And we'll, we'll have to reflect on that. There'll obviously be further discussions with officials about what the and operation uh, means, uh, and we'll have to see in, on the basis of that what uh, what we may or may not wish to do uh, at uh, report. But in the interest of time, I think we've had a, a reasonable uh, debate uh, on this. Uh, I think in discussion with others, we'll see whether we may need to uh, to return uh, to it. Uh, I do take the point that's been made, what gets measured gets done, uh, and I do think that is what we all want to see. We want to see an effective bill that works. That's what we all want, and we may need to see whether further clarification is needed on the face of the bill in order to achieve that. Uh, but with those remarks, I beg leave to uh, withdraw the amendment. It's your Lordship's pleasure this amendment be withdrawn. The amendment is by leave withdrawn. Uh, also after clause 91, amendment 65, Lord Coker. Uh, my, uh, my Lords, I, I, I actually will be reasonably um, brief uh, on, uh, on this uh, particular uh, measure. The, obviously, uh, I move in Amendment 65 uh, in my name with that of my noble uh, friend Lord Ponsby and, and Baroness Blake, but also, again, uh, Amendments 69, 70 and 71 have, have some similar, uh, if not many, similarities, and obviously Baroness uh, Altman's... 106E, again, um, all seeking to do uh, the same thing. So uh, just a few uh, introductory remarks. Um, I know the government is resisting uh, putting on the face of the bill an amount and saying we're going to do this by uh, regulation. But I, I think for, uh, for, for me, I think it's important for Parliament to make a statement about what it thinks is a reasonable fee. Uh, and given, uh, if I understand it, it'd be by negative, I may have got that wrong, but I think it's by negative uh, a, a resolution of the House. If the government, if it wasn't on the face of the bill and the government proposed £40 or £50, it may be that we don't think that's enough, but we won't have any way of, of actually uh, changing that or dealing with, with that. I would point out that in the research that, uh, uh, that I've had done for me, that the £12 fee, as it currently is, the Eurozone average is 300 uh, and the £12 is the sixth lowest incorporation fee in the world. So somewhere along the line, we've got this badly, uh, badly wrong. Uh, and I don't think £100, uh, as my um, amendment uh, and others uh, lays out, is actually something which is going to uh, be something that would deter business or could be seen uh, as anti-business, but is a, a reasonable fee in line with many other... Uh, economies in the world uh, that's been charged and again the opportunity to raise that uh, in, uh, in line with inflation and various other changes made to the companies acts which are consequential upon that. I do think uh, alongside uh, this um, the, the, the uh, amendment by Lord uh, Agnew and others and Lord Cromwell and, and, and others that have put down about the establishment of an economic crime fund rather than reporting uh, on the need uh, for one. I think it's something that uh, we're, certainly from our position we'll need to, to reflect on. But I take the point uh, that, that's made uh, about whether if you just have a fee and then don't, uh, as it's laid out in the bill as it's currently constituted, just goes in the consolidated fund to disappear without trace potentially, um, whereas uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, amendments in this group uh, seek to say, well, we don't just report on it to see whether it's needed. Actually, we think we could establish this uh, economic crime fund, which could then be used to, to do that. In other words, you almost hypothecate it, essentially. It's a, it becomes a hypothecated fee. And, and I, I do take, and I, I just say to Lord, uh, the noble lords who moved the other amendments, I thought, because one of the things that the Treasury will always do is to say, we hate hypothecated tax. It goes against the grain. It's not something we do in principle. But actually, in the explanatory memorandum that's laid out, it shows the other examples of where the Treasury has agreed to the hypothecation of tax. And I think that's a very effective argument, if I might say so, uh, to, to make, uh, in that the principle of hypothecation has been accepted by the Treasury in these instances as laid out 
uh, in the uh, in the other amendments. Why should it not be accepted with respect to this particular uh, uh, element? Uh, my lords, the, 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 without repeating all that's been said, the fundamental point is to create a framework within which economic crime can be effect if in effectively investigated and the law effectively enforced. That is essentially what this is all about. The government will agree with that. The government will say that is our intention. The purpose of my amendment and the purpose of the other amendments in this group is to actually give the government the tools by which that can be achieved, to give the government the resources by which that can actually be done. Uh, in, in later amendments, and no doubt we'll come back to it report, there is real concern about the effectiveness of uh, the uh, the effectiveness of the various bodies we already have to tackle economic crime. This bill will put more, quite rightly, put more, uh, give, uh, say that more needs to be done. How is that going to be achieved and in what way is that going to be achieved? And I think uh, the amendment I've put forward, the, the fee, and looking at whether the establishment of the Economic Crime Fund to then be used to ensure that we have the resources to tackle uh, this, uh, this level of crime that we know uh, is out there is something that this bill needs to address and is actually a real priority. Amendment proposed after clause 91 insert the new clause printed on the marshalled list. My Lord, yes, I'm building really on Lord Coker's comments and I, I think that this again is, is a wonderful opportunity to do something that will put our enforcement agencies onto a much sounder footing in the future. They are very under-resourced. We know, for example, that 40% of crime now in this country is economic crime, and yet we deploy only about 1% of our crime-fighting resources to combat it. And so by ring-fencing, this gives a chance for, to solve that problem. There is a scheme at the moment called the Asset Recovery Incentivization Scheme, ARIS, where the money goes to the Treasury and the Treasury hands some back. But the amounts have decreased that come back by 34% in the last five years at a time when we're seeing escalating numbers of, of, economic, of volumes of economic crime. I particularly put in my explanatory note the examples of hypothecation which the Treasury has agreed over the last few, few years, and as you can see there are several, and some of them are very recent. So we, I just want to try and head off that excuse from the Treasury and say we never do it because they do do it and are doing it regularly. And I would suggest that this is a good opportunity to, uh, to do it as, as any. And so I do hope very much that my noble friend will consider this carefully over the next few weeks because if, if we don't have the resources in, in our crime-fighting agencies, we will not be able to stamp out a lot of this. And in, the US introduced a scheme back in 1984 where all forfeiture proceeds go back into an assets forfeiture, forfeiture fund, and I would hope very much we could do something similar. Name to uh, the amendments 69, 70, and 71 that Lord Agnew has just so powerfully uh, put across. Uh, those of us who participated in what we call ECB 1 will remember that there was a great deal of discussion and points made around the fact that it is pointless passing legislation if you do not resource the enforcement bodies that then have to carry it out. Uh, that, that, I mean, reading back in that debate, it was covered in detail. I simply make the point. Uh, boldly again. Three further points. The fund would appear to need no new money. It would be funded and administered through the fines and the incorporation fees. Uh, there may well be pushback on the hypothecation of funds in principle, but uh, as Lord Agnew has just highlighted, uh, the explanatory notes do illustrate there is plenty of precedent for such a fund. And I'd also suggest that uh, for uh, the crime-fighting agencies, if I can call them that, to be able swiftly and flexibly to access this money rather than having to fight uphill and down dale with the Treasury to try to extract it from them uh, would be a great leap forward. After all, it is they who have achieved these funds through successful prosecutions. Uh, I'd only add one small but I think important qualification. 
which is that uh, we're going to need transparent processes and procedures, including audit, for how these funds are used and by whom. But with that small, uh, rather pedantic caveat, I do lend my support to those three amendments. My Lords, uh, I rise to um, speak to my own amendment 106E in this group, which uh, in a way is an attempt to combine and perhaps strengthen uh, the uh, other amendments in this group um, by, uh, in the names of, of Lord Coker, who's been, who so excellently explained it, Lord Ponsonby and Baroness Blake, and uh, the amendments uh, moved by my noble friend Lord Agnew uh, and supported, of course, by Lord Cromwell, uh, the noble and learned Lord Garnier and Baroness Bowles. Um, I welcome the new duties and powers for Companies House. I think we all um, know that, as the government itself has recognised, there is a severe and growing threat uh, in the area of economic crime. And with the pressure on public funding and the fiscal constraints that we know are being faced and will continue to be, funds have to be found for the transformational changes that are needed to keep pace with the growing and severe threat. So these amendments um, are aiming to raise the funds necessary without going to taxpayers uh, and, and my Amendment 106E uh, seeks to immediately um, use the opportunity of this bill to establish a minimum fee of at least £100 and the international comparisons made by uh, Noble Lord Coker um, ab about how very low our current £12 figure is uh, would, um, would be... Uh, resolved, and quite frankly, if somebody can't afford £100, it's difficult to see why we should approve of them uh, setting up a company in the first place. Um, but the Treasury Select Committee has recommended a fee of £100, and the House of Lords uh, Fraud Select Committee has expressed its concerns about how these new powers will be funded. So the, these amendments uh, attempt to give the government the, the funding that is so clearly going to be required, as all noble lords in the committee have, have already said. Um, and the money would be ring-fenced for fighting the, the economic crime so that the company's house will be able, or should be able, to invest in the capacity needed to prevent and combat economic crime. And that word prevent, I think, is really important, moving from a kind of reactive regulatory approach that we so often see to a more proactive one is going to be really important if we ever want to be ahead of the problems of, of economic crime. Uh, so Companies House has to have some resource. I'm asking for that to be established now. I'm also asking for uh, in 106E, the Economic Crime Fund to be legislated for now rather than uh, the other amendments which talk about having a report looking into that. I just wanted to take this opportunity. It seems so obvious that something of this nature is, is needed. Um, and you know, Companies House is, is going to fundamentally change. It won't be a register anymore. Uh, it has to have this proactive role in... Uh, finding misleading or false information and fighting uh, economic crime, hopefully. So I, I do hope that my noble friend can look uh, favourably on the merits of using this bill to do this now. Um, the only small change in um, the wording of, of 106E from Amendment 65 is that I'm specifying a minimum £100 fee and then the government to consider raising it uh, in line with inflation, not necessarily mandating that that should be done, but an annual consideration of that. Uh, I'm not wedded to, to any of the wording on, on this, but I, I do feel that the strength of putting it into the bill now has significant merits, and I hope that uh, my noble friend 
will agree to uh, consider this carefully. Well, of course, a, a packet of 20 Lambert and Butler Marlboro cigarettes costs £12.65. I mean, that, that, that is how out of proportion the fee for setting up a limited company has become. And I, I, it may well be that you know, government taxation and inflation has influenced um, the price of these cigarettes and it doesn't it doesn't reflect their real value. But but that's the reality of the world that we live in. You know, I mean if you have thirteen pounds in your pocket, you can buy a pack of cigarettes or you can float a limited company. Um, so so there is there is I mean this has got totally out of proportion and these businesses who have this limited liability um, have become a driver of our economy but also I, 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 for, for a significant proportion of them, you know, a serious problem for our uh, for, for our country. I mean, not only has our international reputation been trashed by uh, people who have abused us, um, and 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 people trust us less as as a, a you know a centre of probity and, and 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 good practice, but but they are if the government's apparent accepted assessment of what this costs us annually. Uh, they are taking three hundred and fifty billion pounds out of the economy on a regular basis, and 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 not only are they doing that, but they're doing that in, in a process that has a series of economic activities as they take the money that we all count to GDP, which is utterly ridiculous. And then when the money gets out of the country, quite often in cryptocurrency, it comes back in, and we count it as inward investment. I mean, they have distorted. They have distorted the, the, the reality of the, of, of the economy of our country in a very significant way, and they have stolen significant amounts of money that could have been put to other purposes. So I support these amendments because these two issues need to be addressed. First of all, it needs to be more... Uh, uh, the, 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 the process of setting up a limited company needs to force people to think about what they're doing more. It needs to have a quality about it, and part of that has to be the fee, and the people we charge now, not only with collecting this data, but, be, but for, for being the gatekeeper and the inhibitor of crime, because that's what we're asking companies' house to do, have to be resourced, and substantially that should be resourced, from those people who wish to exercise that uh, privilege of having limited liability with their companies, because it's in their interests to have the ability to do that and not to be characterised with all the rest of these cheats and robbers that are doing it. Um, and that they're being protected in the way in which they, they conduct their business and not being, you know, having money taken from them by fraud and other uh, um, activities that are, are manifestly going on. So it's in their interest to have the, this system work properly and they should pay the appropriate fee for it so that that work can be done. But much more importantly, and this is the real issue that this addresses, is that the measure of the ambition that we have, that Parliament has and that the government says they have, of interdicting all of this behaviour has an enormous prize at the end of that, and that is this £350 billion. And, and, and this is relatively low-hanging fruit, as it was described to be by one of the, his noble lordships and correspondence I had recently with him. It is relatively low-hanging fruit. We know how to do it. We know how to interdict this behaviour and keep this money in our country and stop it from being stolen in this way out of our common resources. It seems to me that the measure of the government's priority for this is that this should have figured in Rishi Sunak's five priorities. This is such an extraordinary, uh, and uh, I mean, such an extraordinary series of things to be happening in our community, and has such dreadful uh, effect. And if you take from this economic crime and fraud is part of it, if you take the effect it is having, because 41% of crime against the person is fraud in our country now, the effect that that is having in almost every single family in our country. Because if we don't have people in our families whom we know are frauded and if we defrauded and if we weren't defrauded ourselves, then we live in constant fear of it. Every text we open, every email that we get that we don't immediately we have a, a, a bit of a beat of the heart about as to whether this has infected our electronic communication in such a way. I mean we are all affected by this. There is a great delivery um, 
to, to be had for the people of the country and the way in which we trust each other and the way in which we live. But there's a lot of money at the end of it, and the money that is going out. And a significant proportion of this money is coming out from the government's own coffers. And, and, we are not, and, 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 and we're, we're not protecting ourselves against that. So um, if the government has an alternative way you know, of, uh, uh, of convincing us that this can be done differently than is proposed in these amendments, then this is the time to tell the House of Lords, because the House of Lords, I think, like the House of Commons, is going to coalesce around these sorts of amendments. Uh, but the difference being that perhaps um, th those people who support them in, in the, your noble lordship's house are going to win the day when it comes to counting the votes. Um, so and, unless we're going to have that, and we all collectively, I think, want the government to bring the 